So I'm going to talk uh, with uh, PowerPoints and hopefully some videos and as you can see some extra bits and pieces on the bench, uh, some of which I have to say I haven't tried before in public. Uh, so we'll see if it works or not and thanks to Andy here at the front for trying to enable all of that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, start off by uh, talking a little bit about what I'm going to do and why we're going to do it. The last picture you saw was an oil rig platform offshore in the North Sea bringing hydrocarbons up to the surface. That's a pretty recent innovation and what I want to start off with is by looking at geological time. Because as Sandy said, I started off my uh, intellectual career as a geologist and that's still where my home territory lies. And the Earth, as uh, in scientific terms, started off about 4,500 million years ago and that geological time is represented by this spiral of geological history. So for the first 200 million years we know very little and we know progressively more and more as we come through towards the present day. So life in its simplest form may be originated two or three hundred years into the Earth. Life in a more complex form we can recognize about a thousand million years ago and life as uh, as uh, the, tr the crew of the Starship Enterprise might recognize it, we began about 600 million years ago as a step change in the chemistry of the oceans. But what I'm showing you here is that as we come through that period of time, we know more and more about what's going on in hundreds of millions of years and tens of millions of years coming round here. And the bit we're interested in today is the most recent bit, less than the width width of that red line. That most recent bit has been given the name of the Anthropocene and this is now starting to become recognized as a new type of geological period, not divided up by these evolutions of land plants and these movements of continents but by divided up this time for a truly unique event when people, us on the surface of the earth, have become more powerful in many ways than natural forces. And that's what I'm going to talk about, the consequences of what we've been doing to the natural circulation systems of the Earth and the consequences of what we might carry on doing in the future. So this unique period we're living in, particularly, as Sandy mentioned, the past 300 years since the 1750s, is uniquely important for us as the allegedly the most advanced species on the Earth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about electricity supply. I'm going to talk about uh, the four options briefly here of electricity supply. There are only four options. You can uh, generate electricity from fossil fuels, which is what we have been doing. 80% of our electricity comes from fossil fuels still. We can generate electricity from nuclear in the future. We can generate electricity from renewable sources. And the smartest thing we can probably do is to be much more efficient about the way we use our electricity. So in all of these I'm going to talk, in this lecture I'm going to talk about why there's a problem, how that problem manifests, what we're going to, and what carbon capture and storage can do about it and what other options might we have. Because the problem we've got here is that we all want reliable electricity like we've got now. We want it at a cheap price, an unfeasibly cheap price. We want that electricity to be derived from secure sources so we don't actually want to have to pay anybody anything and import uh, our sources of energy from anywhere. That's entirely unrealistic at the moment. And we want it to be sustainable, of course, and that's terrific. And we can try and aim there and we'll see if we get there or not. And so these aims and objectives are what electricity might look like in the UK in 30 years' time or 20 years' time. That might not. Uh, if you're a fan of renewables, as I am, most people are, you might say we've looked for 60 or 80 percent renewable energy and much less nuclear. It doesn't matter. You've only got these four dimensions to play with. And that uh, is set against the increasing numbers of world population. So we're at about 6 billion people just now. By the time we get to 2050, we'll be at 9 billion people. They'll all want to behave like we do. They'll want to hopefully not go to Spain for their holidays, but they'll want to eat types of food we do, they'll want consumer goods, they want to behave in a luxurious way. So at the moment, we've got 80% of our electricity 
uh, demand. Electricity use comes from fossil fuel. In fact, probably about 90% of our energy comes from fossil fuel. By 2030, only partway through that population increase, all predictions show that we'll be looking at an extra 50% of demand globally for energy and electricity. So none of this is going to be particularly easy. We're going to have to try and do, uh, make our existing resources go further against this backdrop of continually increasing population. And two uh, fairly sad messages initially. That first of all, we're not going to do it by saving plastic bags. Okay? It's all terrific saving plastic bags, but that's not going to get us out of the problem. And I'm afraid that neither are we going to do it by putting in low energy light bulbs, okay? Because they're still consuming lots and lots of energy, even with low energy light bulbs. And that energy and that electricity in particular needs to come from somewhere. And I'm talking about electricity in particular, we'll see later on, because the view is in this country at any rate that the, if we can solve and clean up electricity, when I say solve, I mean decarbonize, reduce our environmental impact of generating electricity, then that will also help us to clean up our transportation system and also help us to clean up our domestic and industrial heating systems. So we'll address quite a lot of our energy usage by trying to sort out electricity and, and clean up electricity. So if we could go across to the video, so I press laptop on here, do I? On the bottom one, right? And Andy will play the video. So this is the point about why bother. So this is an animation here from 1884 showing you the temperature on the world, the excess temperature. Zero is in white, excess temperatures are in red. And what you should see is that the excess temperatures move around on the world, but as we come, there's a period of heating in the 30s, and as we come through, particularly to the 1980s and 90s, Watch the, watch the Arctic, watch the North Poles, watch the South Poles. Okay. So that tries to average a whole set of measured information and simulated information from the past 100 years. And what that shows to me visually is that there's quite a convincing trend to getting hotter and hotter in the temperate zones and in the northern polar latitudes and in the southern polar latitudes. And that increase of temperature scientifically can be quite convincingly linked to the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, you don't have to believe in that if you don't want to. I think that cause and effect are beyond reasonable doubt. That seems very, very clear that that is a trend which is going on, and we can measure those changes in the weather. We can measure those changes in rainfall. We can measure those changes in storm intensity. We can measure the fact that we had very hot weather last week, unusually hot weather last week in Edinburgh. All I need to do now is to get this computer to work again. No. Right, and that's the same thing expressed graphically by the uh, World Meteorological Association. This is the trend of increasing temperature. This is harder to read, but this is a sort of graph scientifically you might be poring over that stretching from 1850 up towards 2010, hotter episodes at this period of time, and if you can be uh, squinting at these numbers, you'll see that they're all 2000s and 10s and 2005s and 1988s. So over that same time period, there's a distinct and undeniable trend towards getting hotter. Okay, so in simple numbers, 2010 was half a degree warmer than it was uh, when I started going to school. Okay, you can measure that. Uh, you can measure the increase of carbon dioxide. This is a deliberately small graph showing increase of temperature, up, uh, sorry, increase of carbon dioxide up here versus calendar years. That's the history there. That line is the history. These are projections into the future by the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, which you've probably all heard about, this panel of scientists, two or 300 or 400 people globally, who sift and read the evidence and try and come to a consensus view. 
That arrow there shows what the trend of carbon dioxide be has been. This is a magnification of that graph. Here is carbon dioxide uh, emitted. That's measured tons in billions of tons of carbon dioxide. This is history here. This is moving forward. These colored lines are all the projections of the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change on Scientists. Of scientists. You can see that 20, 2006 we went up. We had a bit of recession and we're busy taking off again. So that we have a 12-year trend overall there in our most recent 12 years, which of course matches that heating trend where the measured increase of carbon dioxide is much, much faster than the worst case of the predictions from the Intergovernmental Panel. Okay? And you might remember that that's predicted increases of sea level, it's predicted excess rainfall, it's predicted desertification, it's predicted unnatural, unpredictable rainfall patterns, crop failures, etc., etc. All that's pretty much doom and gloom. Uh, and what I'm saying is the doom and gloom looks as though it could be worse than that. Uh, now, you don't have to believe in climate change. What I'm asking you to believe in is primary school chemistry. If this carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere, then the atmosphere is in equilibrium with the ocean. If you increase the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide is in equilibrium with the surface of the ocean. So more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more dissolves in the surface of the ocean. No climate modeling at all, nothing up my sleeve, no jiggery-pokery, simple primary school chemistry. So we can track the increase of that carbon dioxide, we can measure it, no modeling involved, and then we can measure the change of acidity of the ocean, because if you dissolve more carbon dioxide into water, it becomes more acid. So here's a graph showing you the acidity in terms of pH. So this is uh, more acid with smaller numbers, more alkaline uh, with uh, bigger numbers. And this is in millions of years, tens of millions of years. So this is reconstructed from the geological record 20 million years ago. And you can see there was a small perturbation. But broadly, business as usual, very, very happy existence that we've had during the past 20 million years. But since industrialization, you can now measure the, dec the change of acidity. We can measure this drop of the pH number. That's a measurable effect in the ocean. And what you can predict is that that will decrease still further. The, inc the number will decrease, i.e. the acidity will become not just a factor of 4, but get towards a factor of 10, starting to go to towards a factor of 4 and upwards increased acidity by the end of this century. That's never happened in the past 20 million years. What's going to happen to the oceans? I don't think anybody knows. We've not actually done the live experiment, except that you can go to places where carbon dioxide bubbles out on the seabed. That's what this is. This is offshore of Sicily in the Mediterranean, where volcanic carbon dioxide comes out onto the seabed. And when you people go there to go diving through that, it's effectively an ocean desert. Okay, no life except for brown algae on the seabed. The fish can swim through because they'll swim out of these localized springs of carbon dioxide about as big as this room, but everything else has changed. Okay, that's the future of the ocean if we allow that to become more acid in, by 2100. <coughs> to stop it becoming more acid, you have to stop the carbon dioxide going into the air or you need to take the carbon dioxide out of the air. That carbon dioxide is a consequence of our fossil fuel energy use. How much fossil carbon dioxide is there? Well, uh, there's lots. Okay, so here's a graph showing you gigaton billions of tons of carbon. So I've changed the units. So if you want to change that into carbon dioxide, multiply by three and a half. And this is the amount of oil, gas, coal, and other fossil hydrocarbon reserves and resources in, in the world. What we've used is shown by the purple, approximately. So you can see we're maybe about a third or halfway through our amount of, oil, of liquid oil. Uh, that's giving some people a bit of stress, but uh, that's nothing compared. We've just started on the amount of gas, and we've barely scratched the surface of the amount of coal. And that's not counting tar sand, shale oil, and uh, shale gas, and hydrates all around the continental margins of the world. Okay, so we've perhaps used 5 or 10% of the fossil hydrocarbon. We've increased the temperature of the world by half a degree in the last uh, 30 years. We've increased the temperature of the world by 0.8 of a degree. We've more than enough ability to dig up that fossil carbon, burn it, and uh, 
fry ourselves in a blanket of Venus-type uh, carbon dioxide where the temperature will go up beyond anything we can possibly cope with. And if we account the extra gas which is in the process of being discovered, gas is into a boom time now for the past 10 years, then we can add that much extra gas because you'll watch everybody switching to gas fuel in the future. It's still fossil carbon. We can go back to the geological record. Geology on the world has done this experiment about five times before. It's released lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The last big time it did this was when uh, the, the Europe and the United States and Canada parted company to form the present Atlantic Ocean. And the volcanoes we know along the west of Scotland, of Arran, of Skye, of Mole, of Ailsa Craig type volcanic rocks were intruded at that time. That released a lot of carbon dioxide. And over a geologically short period of time in the Paleocene and Eocene, 55 million years to just 54.8 million years, i.e. 200,000 year period, the carbon dioxide released went up and then gradually came down again. That produced an extinction of lots of land-based life forms which allowed the mammals to get going. So we've actually, our evolution is based on that extinction of land, of land form, land life. But at the moment, we're about a quarter of, the, with what we've done in the past 250 years, we're a quarter of the way along that same track. We're going along exactly the same track, but faster. There's absolutely no reason to believe that the Earth will react any differently, because where we are now is just the same track as has happened in the previous five high carbon dioxide periods in the history of the Earth. And all those periods have, have similar or almost identical effects, being heating, ocean death, and extinction of the higher life forms. The bacteria will be fine. I'm very happy for them. But us, as higher life forms, are not fine. So if we're interested in saving the planet, that's a bit misguided. We're actually interested in saving us uh, this time. Okay, now as a consequence of that evidence, the UK does evidence-based policy in terms of politics and science. So as a consequence of all that evidence, the UK has set up a committee on climate change. And that committee on climate change has assessed the emissions of carbon dioxide, looked at all the different sectors where the carbon dioxide emits from, and 200 million tonnes a year, the, the blue part of this graph here, in, was emitted in 1990 by generating electricity, power generation. So UK policy now is to reduce that emission from electricity generation to make to, so we can have the same and 50% more electricity by 2030, but with much, much less carbon dioxide for each kilowatt hour that we consume. So instead of being an average of about 500 grams of carbon dioxide just now, we'd get down to 50 grams of carbon dioxide just now in the, in the future. So if you're familiar with these bar graphs of energy efficiency you get in shops when you're buying a washing machine, right now we're down at sort of E and F, and we're trying to get up into the A's and B's by 2030. So power gets targeted because it's possible to try and do this. We've got perhaps 40 very big power stations in the UK sending out fossil fuel emissions. We could make, in principle, 40 very big decisions and head down this track. We can do that by closing down power stations. We can do that by cleaning them up. We can head down this track by building new clean power stations, renewable energy. We can go head down this track by using energy more efficiently. It's a combination of all of these, but power unlocks the door into using electricity in industry, by using, elect by using fossil fuel in transport, we can decarbonize, we can shrink all of this graph down uh, up to as far as the green by decarbonizing and transferring to electricity. And that is inherently, implicitly, the strategy uh, which we've got uh, just now. And just to illustrate the size of the problem again, just right now in the UK, we are using 33% of our electricity is coming from coal right now, 45% is coming from gas burning, uh, just 4% from wind and 12% from nuclear. So it just shows right now at uh, 6.45 on Tuesday, we're totally hooked into fossil fuels. So we've got to try and change all that by 2030. And that's an extremely difficult task. It's never been done before. And that is where the role of university research and universities come in. Inventing stuff is what we get paid to do 
and this needs some serious inventing. So, how does this carbon capture and storage stuff actually work? Here's a conceptual graphic which is not to scale, it's trying to get everything onto a page. This is mining the fuel from coal mines uh, which may be in Scotland but may be in uh, Russia, east of, the, uh, east of uh, Siberia, or the coal may be in Venezuela, so it's hard to draw this to scale. This is oil and gas coming out of the North Sea, uh, in the southern North Sea or offshore from Norway. We mine our fossil hydrocarbon, we bring it to the UK and we burn it. And we burn it in the power station and at the moment it's socially acceptable to put all the waste, put the carbon dioxide waste products up the chimney and dump them into the atmosphere. So 100% of the carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere and that is all around you just now. What I'm talking about is the concept or the, the practice of can we scrub that? Can we clean that up? Can we burn the fuel without emitting? So we clean that up, capture the carbon dioxide at the power station by chemistry or by some smart engineering which I'll talk about in a minute, and can we then liquef purify the carbon dioxide, liquefy it, and transport it by pipes for maybe 50 kilometers, maybe 400 kilometers, then where we can inject it deep beneath the sea into porous and permeable rocks, layers of rocks which have microscopic holes in them, so we're putting the carbon dioxide liquid back where it came from deep underground, we want it to stay there for 10,000 years into the future whilst the atmosphere of the earth gets back to normal. So that's the proposition, that's what carbon capture and storage is about. The, the uh, advantage of doing this is that it's a very direct carbon reduction. It's can actually on the site of the power plant that could reduce the emissions by 90% and even if you include the mining and extraction of the fuel, that could still reduce the emissions by 75%. So it's not perfect, but it's a very big and very direct carbon reduction where we don't have to change things terribly much. We can use our existing electricity wires, our existing power station sites, and uh, we can, in principle, do this uh, quite rapidly. So that's the advantages. We can carry on misbehaving as usual and clean up. Somebody will clean up after us. The disadvantages, which I'll talk about as well, is that this isn't actually working at large scale yet. There are several places, there are six places around the world where this is working to some extent. It's not proven at big scale. And to do this, to convert a power station, is a big item of kit. And it needs a big item of cash. Okay, so to do this, to cross the barriers, to jump into the swimming pool, if you like, is difficult the first time round. And, of course, uh, for the... Uh, uh, people concerned about environmental transfer, environmental debt in other countries, which is absolutely correct, then it perpetuates and accentuates coal mining in other countries, extraction of oil and gas from elsewhere around the world. So we're still hooked on fossil fuel. So that it's not a perfect solution. But to do this, this is the International Energy Agency, to do this to its full scale means starting now and then ramping up towards 2050. And this means doing thousands of projects around the world, probably 3,000 power stations around the world by 2050. Okay, so it's a very big undertaking. It's changing the whole of the global power industry. And if that can be done, because we know how to do this sort of thing in, the, in industrial terms, because this would transport at its full extent in 2050, this would transport a fluid volume of carbon dioxide similar to the oil and gas we transport at the present day. In fact, we transport a lot more water than that every day. We transport about four or five times more water than that every day out of oil fields, which we either dump over the side or we re-inject into the ground. So this is technologically feasible. It's up to us and the governments to work out, are we going to be bothered paying for it or are we just going to carry on mortgaging the future? So how does this work? Okay, so I can show you lots of complicated uh, graphics, but basically... You bring the flue gas from the power station into here, into this item of equipment. And this item of equipment has been tested at Longanet Power Station here in central Scotland, about 40 kilometres west of Edinburgh. So this was tested by Scottish Power for about 12 months, uh, up until the middle of uh, 2010. So the flue gas is diverted into here, goes through this tower, 
where it's uh, an amine chemical rains down upon it and the amine adsorbs the carbon dioxide, dissolves preferential in the amine and the nitrogen flue gas goes up the chimney but uh, without any carbon dioxide and then that amine is transferred through here, is heated up to recover the amine chemical which is recycled round and then the pure carbon dioxide is sent away uh, down the pipeline. So that's a very simple principle of that. And there are three ways of doing carbon capture and I'm going to show, Andy's going to show us a video in a minute about one of those ways, a slightly different way uh, and that was the way we're going to show it was the first proposition for industrial carbon scale carbon capture in the world which was offshore of Scotland in 2005 by BP but before we head there I just want to point out that this again is very big engineering. Here's an oil platform here, that's the actual size of an oil platform in the North Sea. This is Princes Street and Edinburgh Castle. Okay, so that tries to give you an idea about how big that is. So now I want to play the video, so I now do this. And this video is from BP, this is to support their proposition in 2005 that we could do carbon capture and storage offshore of Scotland. So the carbon dioxide, I've lost my pointer, comes from the oil field at the top, we produce natural hydrocarbons, gas in this case from the gas field at the top, that's fed into the power station, you build the carbon capture unit which in this case would split the gas into its two parts, into carbon and carbon dioxide and into hydrogen. The carbon dioxide goes away down the pipe in the uh, yellow and blue dotted lines to be stored beneath the sea, the hydrogen goes into the power station, hydrogen is burned in the power station and burning hydrogen just makes water when it combines in the air, hydrogen plus oxygen makes water and so you're using that hydrogen to, as an energy carrier instead of the methane gas as the energy carrier that generates electricity sends that to us and meantime the carbon dioxide can be sent down in this proposition you can make some extra money out of that, send the carbon dioxide down into an oil field which is redundant oil field and by putting the carbon dioxide into that oil field that dissolves extra oil, makes that less viscous, makes it more runny so that the oil can start to produce more oil from that oil field. So you can produce between 7% and 20% additional oil domestically from the UK in, with much much less carbon impact or perhaps even a negative carbon impact because the calculations we do show that you can store more carbon in the ground, more carbon dioxide in the oil field compared to the extra oil you've produced. Okay, so this is a, can be a win-win situation where you're producing clean power, you're produ storing the carbon dioxide in the ground and you're producing additional oil. Okay, so let's go back to that and so what, what's happening around the world? Uh, so this is in Edinburgh we've got a large group working on carbon capture and storage uh, and one of the things we do is track the projects globally so here's a map uh, from September 2010 not so long ago these are carbon capture and storage projects uh, proposed around the world and so these are projects which have got funding but are not built so three or four in Australia, several in China, Abu Dhabi, several in Europe, Canada, United States. These are projects which have got small pilots operating, perhaps one, two uh, and will be a third down here in Australia and these are ones which are actually working and the green blobs you're looking quite hard to spot them. Here's one in the centre of Algeria, here's one in the North Sea, here's one at the North Cape of Norway and here's one at the border of uh, Canada and uh, United States. So there's a lot of talk about carbon capture and storage but only for going on six now projects actually operating. So moving up along that graph to create a world industry is quite a slow process at the moment. But nonetheless it's starting, we're sitting there on the runway with the propellers running, will it happen or not? We'll find out, I don't know, I don't know, we'll find out in the next five or ten years. You'll get lots of advertising, there's 280 proposals around the world, we've screened practically all of those out when we make our map, that again is the value of impartial academic assessment because most of these proposals are punted by power companies who want to appear to be green but are not, so our assessment is that only maybe 12 of those are real, okay, in 2010. 
I'm now going to talk about storage. I'm going to talk about a few technical bits. Where's this carbon dioxide stored? Well, it's stored in sandstone rock. And that might seem a bit counterintuitive. Here's a picture of a sandstone rock with a 20 pence for scale. Here's uh, grains of sand. This is from Arran in Scotland. And here I've magnified this as a, as a sketch. Here's the grain of sand, grains of sand, and here's the carbon dioxide in between these sand grains. Now I'm now going to go and switch to this um, set of gear over here, hopefully. And so the idea of this is that what we have is a, is a, a sandstone rock. How do I do that now? Must need to press something. VCR, do you think? Laptop, right. Okay, so we've now got uh, this piece of rock here, which is a lump of sandstone rock. This is pretty much what Edinburgh, central Edinburgh is built out of. Sandstone rock about 350 million years old. It's solid, okay, very solid, but about 20% of this is space, and that's exactly like the rocks deep beneath the North Sea. We plan to inject carbon dioxide into, and what we need is a lid shown by my children's Play-Doh, and this children's Play-Doh is the impermeable seal on top of that. And what we're trying to do is drill some boreholes in a place where we've got a bent lid, we've got a, a topography below ground with that seal on it, drill a hole through and inject the carbon dioxide sideways into that reservoir. Okay, so that's the simple principle of what goes on. And that works because the rock is porous and is permeable. And if this works, then I've got a different piece of rock here, which is a red sandstone from the west of Scotland. I'll put that there. Can you see that? Okay. And I've just got some water in here. This is sand grains here, and I'm just going to try dropping this bit. This is one of the more dangerous bits. And you can see that... Uh, oh, it does work. That's cool. And you can see that that water has just uh, gone straight into that porous and permeable sandstone. So sand has a lot... Of sandstone has got a lot of space in it. This particular red rock's got about 30% space in it, that's why I'm using it. But you can see that also is pretty solid. Not all rocks are porous and permeable. Here's a piece of geological slate, uh, which is from uh, the Southern Highlands. This is not porous and not permeable. This is why you use it on roofs. So you can see that the water doesn't sink into that. The water instead just runs off the side, which is why it keeps the rain out on your house. That's what you need on the top. So we're looking for uh, a, a porous rock with a non-porous rock. And this is a piece of the rock from the North Sea, a uh, type of rock from the North Sea. This is a mudstone or a shale. And you can see it's, got, it's a black rock. It's got lots of carbon in it. This is actually where the oil comes from. And uh, you can see the white bits are fossils, fossil ammonites in this case. So that's the geological combination. You need a porous and permeable rock with a lid on the top of it, a lid on the saucepan. Inject the carbon dioxide into the rock and this lid stops the carbon dioxide coming up to the, towards the surface again. So what uh, a lot of people want to know is, well, well, how does that work? Well, it works, and I'm now going to try another really dangerous bit. It works by injecting the carbon dioxide with a borehole into the uh, underground rock layers. And I'm going to show this, to, this model here. This is a model of that porous sandstone. You can see here we've got blue sand grains, slightly magnified for effect, of course. And we've got a, an impermeable lid on that top, this time with uh, fetching purpley pink plasticine. OK, and that's the impermeable layer. And the blue is the uh, groundwater, which is held deep beneath the, which is deep beneath the ground, fills up all that pore space normally. And in this case, you can see we've got a structure, a geological structure. It's a slight fold under the ground. It's a hill underground. This is where oil and gas fields are found. And you can see in this one, then we've got a little bit of gas at the top, a little bit of uh, white at the top there where there's some uh, residual gas. So this is pretty much a representation of a gas field where we've produced the gas. We've burned that in our houses and in our power stations. And we'll then try and refill that by injecting with carbon dioxide. And we drill a borehole off to the side and we inject the carbon dioxide. Okay. 
So you can see that I injected 4% carbon dioxide by breathing into it, and that has depressed the water level. Okay, so we've injected some carbon dioxide, and it's moved the groundwater out of the way, created some space, and we've now got uh, carbon dioxide stored beneath the ground. And that we know from geological examples that can stay there for tens of millions of years in the North Sea. You'll also notice that we sprung a leak, okay, on this one. You might know, I can see we sprung a leak because this isn't perfect. So geologically, we're looking for a perfect system. And we know we can find those geologically underground because that's where oil and gas is reservoired. But even if something goes catastrophically wrong, I've brought a sample of this carbon dioxide rich water with us today. And so uh, this is another risky bit, so I'm going to clear some stuff out of the way. So if there's an earthquake, what happens? Okay, so there's a, let's say there's an earthquake. And so we're going to leak a bit. So it leaks, okay. But you can see that uh, approximately 99.9% .9 of everything stayed in there, okay. So if, if you put this underground and the worst case happens, there's a magnitude 6 or even a magnitude 8 earthquake, most of the carbon dioxide, or practically all, let's say, for insurance purposes, 99.9% .9 of the carbon dioxide is still in the water. It's a fail-safe proposition. This is not a big bang eruption. This is not an explosion. It's not a ball of flame. And actually, you could still probably drink it. Hmm, jolly good. So I'm trying to demonstrate that putting this underground is feasible, it's understandable, and it's actually quite straightforward. And where are we going to put this underground? Well, the last type of thing I want to uh, demonstrate whilst I'm on the camera is, is this. This is a scale model of uh, carbon dioxide storage. I have here a pack of cards, or two packs of cards, in fact. And these are layers of rock below ground, OK? You might have seen layers of rock below ground, lots of individual beds of sandstone and mudstone below ground. Now to scale, at about two kilometers below ground, to scale the thickness of rock we're trying to put it in is this playing card. So what we're trying to do is inject carbon dioxide into a layer of rock there, and all, this other, all these other layer of rocks are what keeps it in. Okay, so there's many, many safety and retention systems there. And to scale, we know a bit about what goes on underground because we've got 10,000 different boreholes in the North Sea. We've got lots of seismic reflection information. It's one of the best surveyed geological areas in the world. And to scale, uh, if I've got a borehole in here, we actually know quite a lot because from a borehole like this paperclip here, then we can get enough information out of that matched with the seismic reflection information that if Rudra at the back there holds up a paper clip, that's the next borehole to scale in the oil field. And we can understand enough about the rock in between these two to make extremely good predictions to get the oil and gas out. Thank you very much, Rudra. Your PhD is in the bag, right? <laughs> OK, so I'm just trying to give you a very quick illustration that we, under that we understand uh, enough about the subsurface, or in fact more than enough, to try and undertake this safely and securely. Now, offshore of Scotland, uh, this has been, well, offshore of Norway, technically speaking, this has, been, this has already been going on. This is the image I showed you at the beginning, the, oil, the offshore oil platform. Here we've got oil being produced, carbon dioxide being injected. And in the Sleipner field, that's already happening since 1996. Here's one of those saline aquifer formations uh, beneath, deep beneath the sea. Offshore of Scotland, the work we've done in university shows that uh, we've got lots of saline formations, lots of rocks which can do that. Here's a map of Aberdeen, Inverness, Orkney, Shetland. The red bits are the oil fields, the orange bits are the uh, gas fields. The places we can put carbon dioxide are shown by the, by the red bits. Those are layers of rock, sometimes many layers, 10 layers thick, each of which can be one or 200 meters thick. There's lots and lots of space out there. Okay, so I'm now going to crack on because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. Uh, I'm just going to skip over a few slides, but the, before I do that, my final point here is 
that in Scotland and offshore of the UK in general, we actually hold more storage for carbon dioxide than any other country in Europe. Okay, so like we were uniquely advantaged in terms of oil and gas, we're uniquely advantaged in terms of carbon dioxide storage. So the UK has got about a third of all the storage in Europe, and Scotland has got about half of the offshore storage in Europe. So we've got a huge natural advantage. We can actually make a business out of accepting carbon dioxide from other countries and then uh, storing it uh, deep beneath the North Sea safely and securely. So we win the business. We offer a helpful service to the rest of uh, Europe. Now I'm going to move on a little bit here to save some time. So I'm going to miss out lots of technical stuff which you're not terribly interested in. And I'm going to talk about natural carbon dioxide sites because just like I showed you with the bottle, people are always interested in, well, what happens if it leaks? Well, we can tell what happens if it leaks by going to places where it leaks. So these are places where carbon dioxide, natural carbon dioxide, leaks to the surface. This is Crystal Giza, near to the Green River in Colorado, in Utah, sorry, in the United States. Here's a borehole which was drilled looking for oil and it found carbon dioxide. It erupts as a geyser, a cold geyser, twice a day. And you can see that it's sufficiently dangerous that there's no fence. And it's sufficiently dangerous that people come up and gawp at it as a tourist attraction. Okay. Here... Uh, off uh, in uh, southeastern Italy, here are the suburbs of Rome. Here's EasyJet coming into the airport. Here's a football pitch. Here's the suburbs of Rome. Here's a carbon dioxide seep, a natural carbon dioxide seep from the aquifers underneath Rome where you get your bottled water in Italian restaurants. That, again, is not dangerous. Here's the largest carbon dioxide seep in Europe, which is also in southeast Italy. This is so dangerous it's got a sign on it saying it might die. And uh, this has the leakage rate of about one gas-fired power station each year. Okay? So the impact of that at the surface is about two five-a-side football fields. Okay? Now this is dangerous because that's in a hollow, a topographic low carbon dioxide, as I'm sure you know, is more dense than air, so it sits in the hollows. Uh, two uh, very keen archaeologists went in there to excavate the pre-Roman relics which had been offered to the gods of the underworld and, of course, were groveling around on the floor and, unfortunately, breathed far too much carbon dioxide and died. Uh, but we looked then at all the Italian seeps in Italy and there are some 300 and odd seeps. About 286 of those seeps have really good records of what's happened to them during the past 50 years and... During the past 50 years, there have been 19 deaths in Italy from, uh, from all these carbon dioxide seeps. Now, Italy leaks about 10% of all the natural carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere at the present time, natural carbon dioxide. So there are only 19 deaths in 50 years from unfenced, unsigned, totally open seeps with a population exposed to that of about 25 million people. So we calculate that the risk of dying is about 1 in 36 million. Okay? So that's rather less than winning the lottery. Okay, jackpot. So it's uh, very, very low risk indeed. So to all intents and purposes, if people, if in an engineered storage, in a, in a commercial storage, you would monitor that, you would watch that, you would get early warning of any leakage, it would actually be much more safe and secure than any of that. How much would all that cost? Okay, well, if this is my electricity bill, you might have noticed on the back of your electricity bill, if you're a bit of a geek, then you get a breakdown of where all the costs come from. So here's the profit for Scottish gas providing my electricity. I don't believe that. You know, that's... <laughs> anyway, but uh, what they claim is that uh, this is the wholesale generating cost, the red bar, the cost of generating the electricity. If we add the cost of doing the carbon capture onto that, that puts up that price, undoubtedly. But what that means is that if I... I did this slide a couple of years ago, obviously, 2009. If I was paying... The average person was paying about £500 a year for electricity. If we did carbon capture and storage on all of the fossil fuel power plants in the UK, that would put your electricity bill up by £30 a year. So that's it's more, but I think I would put it to you that's a price which is acceptable to pay what you're getting. So carbon capture and storage can work. It can be done. But I'm now going to move on to a couple of other things in the last five minutes or so, ten minutes perhaps. This is the Global Carbon... This uh, International Energy Agency, sorry. 
tracking renewable energies, biofuel, biomass power, hydropower, solar, all green, all building away happily, merrily around the world, doing lots of feed-in tariffs and things on people's roofs and all that. But the thing which is standing out as being red is carbon capture and storage and electric uh, vehicles. These are not happening. Okay, so it sounds good, but it's not happening. And it's not happening because it costs a lot for a power station. So, give up. No, I don't know. Do something. <laughs> or, be even smarter. What else can we do? Okay, so carbon capture and storage reduces the rate of emission. But what else could we do? So, a lot of people are very keen on climate engineering, fixing the Earth's climate which is deliberately intervening with the uh, climate control systems. Uh, you might have seen that the exper first big experiment, uh, first ex UK experiment for this last week has been cancelled or deferred because of ethical considerations at the moment. And this is to put a balloon up into the atmosphere and spray sulfur dioxide rich water into the atmosphere to mimic a volcanic eruption and that will then cool the earth by reflecting a bit of extra radiation. So people are going to want to do this. There are lots of ideas for doing this. You know, every, lots of things. You can put aerosols in the stratosphere. You can put uh, aluminium foil in orbit. You can make extra rainfall. You can grow grass in the desert. You can even pump carbon dioxide into rocks. A lot of these appear to be, will be quite cheap because you just need to send up a lot of uh, spare military airplanes and you can cruise around the stratosphere spraying carbon, spraying sulfur dioxide quite easily for maybe 50, 100, 500 million pounds a year. Very feasible. But if you do that, that's not fixing the ocean. Remember I said there were two problems at the beginning. There's the heating problem, which you can either believe or not believe, but there's also the ocean acid problem. Just reflecting a bit more sunshine isn't going to stop the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's not going to stop the acidity of the ocean. So a lot of geoengineering schemes, I think, are, are fatally flawed. And what we need to do in terms of carbon dioxide through time is to get onto technologies which actually suck up carbon dioxide out of the air. So there's lots of propositions for building industrial scale pieces of things, chimneys, things which suck carbon dioxide out of the air, store it, put it in the, in the ground. And I've seen lots of these. There's lots of them. They're very straight, they're brown, they've got sticky out things at the top and they're covered in green things. And they're about 20 meters high. And you saw them down and you make logs out of them. Okay, so we actually know how to do this already. We don't need to engineer anything. What we've got is a natural system where trees grow and vegetation grows, rots and it dies, and the carbon dioxide, carbon in the soil rots, goes back into the atmosphere. What we're proposing here is to intervene with uh, smart making of charcoal, effectively this pyrolysis step, which is smart charcoal making, and get some energy out of that and return the carbon to the soil as charcoal. Charcoal is geologically resistant. Okay, to decay, you can find charcoal which is thousands of years old in soil. So we've set up a center for doing this at the University of Edinburgh, which is turning biomass, which is waste straw, waste wood chips, into charcoal and getting oil and energy as byproducts of that. Okay, so this is new science. Again, the role of the university is to do the new science and provide the evidence and the classification and the knowledge which enable governments and industries to try and make legislation and try and make money out of this, but also to try and help the public to decide whether they want to do this or not. Okay, so this is an entirely new endeavor, trying to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So this is the old way of doing it, making charcoal. This actually makes more emissions, more greenhouse effect rather than just simply rotting. Uh, what we've uh, bought and built is uh, fairly simple instrumentation equipment which is about the size which any farm or any village can use and that puts the biomass in, controls the temperature, controls the rate, controls the oxygenation and we get oil out and we get charcoal out and that's what we're busy investigating trying to make that into a system where we can get the heat, get the oil and use that and put the charcoal back in the ground because when you put the charcoal in the ground this is uh, agricultural trials down at uh, Rothamsted Research Institute, in which we're collaborating with. We put plots into the ground, we put uh, biochar, charcoal, on some of these plots, and we can discover that in many cases that 
enhances the plant growth of crops. So you can put carbon in the ground, you can enhance the growth of crops, you can decrease the fertilizer input, and you can start to be able to feed those 3 billion extra people by 2050. <coughs> so that's good. That can suck carbon out of the atmosphere. What if we did them both together in the last three, four minutes now? Here's a power station. You might not like it, but that provides lots of electricity. These power stations can burn biomass in there. Most of these power stations can burn coal or can gasify biomass and burn a mixture of biomass, co-firing. That's not the same as burning 100% biomass, like the propositions in Leith or in Dundee or at Grangemouth. Uh, personally, I think burning 100% biomass in big power stations is entirely misguided. You want to save that for primary schools in the north of Scotland where you don't have any uh, gas grid. Uh, but if you co-fire biomass in with this power station and then you capture the carbon dioxide from all of that 80 or 90 percent fossil fuel and 10 percent biomass, then you're producing energy from fossil fuel, but you're gradually pumping back carbon dioxide from the atmosphere underground at the same time. So you have your cake and eat it. So fossil fuels, we emit lots of carbon dioxide. Fossil fuels, we can try and bury most of the carbon dioxide, but that just slows the rate of leakage, so it's still not effective. Bioenergy, we're just churning that round, so that's great if we had enough bioenergy, but if we covered all of the UK in trees, we could still only produce 5 to 10% of the energy we need. But bioenergy with carbon capture and storage holds the proposition of being overall carbon negative to try and get the carbon dioxide level further down. So that for me, is the next research frontier after we've crossed the one we haven't quite done yet. So, but of course, we need to be careful. Biomass use has got lots of well-known adverse consequences, and this has to be structured, this has to be sustainable. It can only have a limited impact, and it has no impact at all if it's not sustainable. So we have to make a choice in the future. Here's the parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're trying to, with conventional technologies, with energy efficiency on power stations, even with carbon capture and storage, we can get the carbon dioxide level down towards 350 parts per million. With bioenergy and carbon capture and storage, by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we can probably get down to the level we need to be at and for a much cheaper price in terms of US dollars. Okay? So we have to choose, do we want the lowest cost, which is just tinkering with what we've already got. Do we want to limit the environmental impact? How deliverable is it going to be? Who's going to pay? How, and how efficient do we want it to be? And so to finish off, unfortunately you can't read that very easily, but what I've said here is that the world's burning too much carbon just now. That's pretty clear. Decarbonizing the electricity is a good first step in getting towards where we want to be in terms of sustainability, genuine sustainability. We have to be more efficient, that's the best first step, but it's still a step many of us don't bother doing. How many people have actually fitted solar panels and uh, insulation around their walls of their house? That's what I want to know. And uh, if we do carbon capture and storage on coal burning and on gas burning, we can decarbonize electricity, heating and transport, and that means we can genuinely choose between risky geoengineering or more sustainable biochar and biomass with carbon capture. And that's it. Three minutes over time, but thank you very much for staying. That's me. Okay, thanks very much, Stuart. I know Stuart's uh, very happy to, to uh, have some questions from the audience. So I think we've got two microphones here. If I could ask that, uh, if you've got a question, if you could stick your hand up. Uh, and I'll try to identify you sort of in order and, and point to you. And if you could wait until the microphone reaches you, because we're recording this, uh, and so that both feeds into the recording, but also means that uh, your colleagues can hear you. So if you've got any questions for Stuart. <coughs> yeah. Uh, um, thank you, very interesting. Thank you for your talk. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't know if the sound recorder is coming. 12% uh, nuclear. Yeah. 100% nuclear, you wouldn't produce any carbon dioxide at all. No, you wouldn't, but uh, what are you going to do to get to 100% nuclear? 
because remember, uranium is also a fossil fuel. So they're not making any more concentrated uranium in the world. The types of reactors we've got at the moment burn uranium very, very ineffectively. And you can quite straightforwardly work out that it would be fine for the UK to go 100% nuclear. We could technically do that. Uh, but the rest of the world can't do that because if the rest of the world doubled the nuclear fleet, we'd have enough uranium for about the next 40 years. And that lays aside the intractable problem that nobody's yet actually stored the radioactive waste and lays aside the problem that nuclear is very inflexible, so when everybody comes in at 5 o'clock and wants electricity, all of a sudden they won't have it. So some nuclear might be fine, but 100% is too far. Somebody at the back there. Yeah. Or two people at the back. See, the people at the back always wake up later on. Yeah. Hi, uh, just a quick question on the ocean uh, model you had at the start. Is the reason that there's no plant life there due to the carbon, too much carbon dioxide in the water, or is it due to a change in pH? Uh, or what's the reason for the lack okay. of fish? And My understanding is it's due to the increase of pH, and that changes the metabolism of organisms who breathe the water, and anybody who's in the seabed, who's burrowing in the seabed, that change of pH has also changed the chemistry of the pore water in the sediment, because you get a different mix of metal, ions, etc., in the sediment. So as a combination of circumstances, depending on what sort of life form you are, they're either catastrophic or not very good. Uh, and, but some, manifestly, some life can survive. So again, the planet will be fine. The planet has done this five times before and come through it. But the more complex and evolved life forms are the ones which tend to suffer most. I don't suppose you happen to know the pH of that water, do you, by any chance? I don't, but I can direct you to two very good articles. Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, I think, last year, and then there was one in Nature about 2009 as well. Yep. Thanks very much. Absolutely fascinating. And it sounds like a great idea. Why isn't everybody doing it if it's something to add 5% or so of the cost of end user electricity? Well, I think uh, it's a great question, of course. So the video I showed in the second video I showed was the proposition by BP for the Peterhead power station heading to the Miller oil field, so northeast Scotland going off sh offshore. And that was put up at, in 2005, and uh, that got jumped on by the Treasury in the UK, and the Treasury decided that they didn't quite know how much it was going to cost to the nearest ten pounds or so for the price of electricity. And also the job of the Treasury is not to spend anybody's money. And so the Treasury, I think, has stopped it. That's my supposition. And where we are now, we've now just about gone through to the second cycle of all this. I showed a picture of Longanet Power Station practicing carbon capture in 2010. The government at present has a competition in the UK to fund uh, the first carbon capture and storage power plant. And Longanet Power Station is the last survivor in that uh, competition. Uh, however, it's not clear if the Treasury and the Department of Energy and the power company are going to agree monetary terms on all that because the company has to make a business out of this. It can't do it because we all think it's a nice thing. It's going to have to get paid the relevant amount for the electricity. And that, sadly, doesn't seem to have been sorted out adequately at the moment. So in the UK, it might happen. We could, this time next year, be leading the world in this, if that proposition goes ahead. Or if that doesn't, then probably China will be uh, moving past everybody because China's got about four or five projects on the go now at different size scales and China will uh, at some time to suit itself decide to motor on with this. Um, if you got this up and running with like the 3,000 power plants or whatever, how long would it actually be sustainable before we still ran out of fossil fuels? Right. Uh, well, I've, I showed you a graph of uh, the amount of fossil fuel on the planet. You might remember there was one with yellow bars and purple at the bottom. And so uh, since uh, the past 300 years, we've maybe used a few percent of the available fossil fuel. We don't actually know how much methane's out there frozen on continental margins, and we don't actually know how much shale gas there is out there in Russia and Poland and North America. So I think we've safely got, if we wanted to do, two or 300 years worth of fossil fuel combustion quite easily. Obviously, what the point I'm making is that's a resource. You can burn it. It'll keep you warm, but it will have very adverse consequences unless that's burned 
with carbon capture or with sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, yeah, thank you for lecture, lots of interesting stuff. Um, one thing you did briefly mention about uh, the carbon emissions from mining and I'm just interested in if the, the you're aware of any ways in which that, that can be captured as well. Uh, another thing quickly is that George Osborne this afternoon was busy reassuring the Conservative Party faithful that, uh, that Britain wasn't going to go very much further than any of its European neighbours in, in kind of tackling this. Do you feel that there is enough confidence in uh, the business environment for this technology in the UK for it really to go ahead or, or is, are, are people too nervous? I mean, Longanet Power Station being the only one left in that competition uh, is, is a good example of, of uh, some sort of candles that have, have burnt out a little bit. Okay, uh, so the first question was how do you catch emissions from coal? Uh, right, well, some of the emissions are pretty difficult. Uh, so uh, you can do more. So as you probably know, if you mine coal, then you have uh, fire damp or methane gas or coal bed methane comes with that in the coal seam. So you can evacuate that from the coal seam before you mine it. So you can reduce the emissions of mining that way. There are places, a couple of places in the world now where people have put effectively a big warehouse on top of the, uh, their coal mine to catch the emissions when those, comes at, those come out. Uh, so that catches emis some emissions from coal mining. Uh, emissions from spoil heaps, from oxidation of uh, waste material on surface, pretty hard to do anything about that. And it's also pretty hard to do anything about transport emissions. So some of those, I think, are, all, are going to be inevitably there. So that's, I'm pretty clear to point out that carbon capture and storage is not the ultimate and final solution. It's a good first step, but it's not the end game. Uh, second point uh, about governments looking across to see uh, are they level with everybody in the sprint? Uh, that, I think, is the problem, that uh, the governments talk a, a good talk on this, but it's pretty clear that there's not a lot of uh, checkbooks being flashed around the world to, to pay the costs of these first very big experiments because uh, the experiment in my mind is actually not so much as an experiment as a validation. Uh, there's plenty of sums, calculations, number crunching been done that it's highly probable, like 98% probable this will work. It's a question of how much it's going to cost, how fast can you drive down the cost. And uh, if you're going to do that in your country, why should we bother doing it if the next door three countries are not going to do it? And that's part of the human market condition. And I think we've got ourselves in a problem by marketizing everything that we're prepared to pay uh, the short-term price, but we don't see the long-term value. And so again, I think Britain has historically, scientifically led the world through a lot of new constructions and uh, social constructions. And this is another opportunity to do that. I think we've one of the best positioned countries in the world actually to do that. And so I'm biased, but I think we should experiment with it Otherwise, we never know whether it's going to work properly or not. Once the first aeroplane's taken off, then everybody will believe that heavier-than-air objects can actually fly. It's that type of thing we need to do now. Over there. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, you showed a number of carbon sinks in Italy. Uh, as kind of natural examples of an equivalent thing you would create in carbon capture. But all of those were, uh, appeared to be above ground. I was wondering if there was any uh, undersea uh, kind of carbon sinks that had sprung leaks and whether um, what occurred then or whether there was any important consequences there. Yeah, OK. So, so I'll just try and rephrase your question a little bit. I showed pictures of carbon seeps uh, leaking out at the surface in Italy. And I think you spoke about carbon sinks, which is, to me, technically where you put carbon and it stays there. So I want to make that distinction. I showed places where carbon dioxide is leaking. And the, I showed you a land map of that. And uh, there's, I showed you earlier on a picture. When I was talking about the ocean, I showed you a, a submarine picture, and that's offshore of Sicily. So the, uh, uh, there, are, there are several seeps submarine offshore of Italy uh, where carbon dioxide leaks out in very concentrated uh, form in bubbles. Tens of percent of carbon dioxide leaks out, and that's why you, you can go there 
and try and have a vision of the future about what would happen if the ocean became acid, or conversely, you can gain a lot of information about what might happen if an engineered, a man-made or a person-made storage site, if that leaks unintentionally, then look at the rate of leakage, look at the area it affects, it, and so on. And in fact, in, as part of our research program uh, in university, we're part of a large uh, UK project which is, trying to, which is going to inject a small amount of carbon dioxide into the seabed offshore of Scotland in the area about the size of the front of the bench here, but again, deliberately as a controlled experiment to try and understand what happens if carbon dioxide comes out through that shallow sediment. But the effects, as far as we can tell at the moment, for a, a, a leakage from an engineered site is quite small in size scale and quite small in its local effect. Uh, and so it's not, a, again, like the seepage on land, it is there, it is a risk, but it's not, a, it's not nearly as big a risk as putting 100% of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is what we're presently doing. Uh, is it easier to build new power stations with this technology than to refit them? It's undoubtedly more efficient to build a new power station because if you build a new power station, let's say you build a new coal-fired power station, instead of, being, instead of getting 32% of the energy out of the fuel from a new one, you'd get 47% out of the energy out of the fuel and then you'd have an energy penalty for doing the carbon capture, maybe take 3 or 4% off that, so you'd still end up with 40-something percent of the overall energy as electricity. So it's better to do that. Gas-fired power stations, even better, so you get something like 68% of the energy out of the methane gas building a new power station. But just like cars, if you like, I would love a new car, but I have to make do with my old one, even though it's less fuel-efficient than the the new one might be and there's a slow but continuous turnover of the equipment and the technology and that slow and continuous turnover it happens with power stations as well and that's one of the roles of government is to set the rules so that when somebody a company builds a new power station then they build an efficient one and they build one which can do this carbon cleanup carbon capture and storage when it becomes viable thank you very much Stuart. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.